All right, it's 4.10, uh, so I think we can get going. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce um, Costas Caridis from UC Riverside, who is also a collaborator of mine in a number of projects in this domain. Uh, Costas got his PhD from the University of Delaware, working with uh, Bert Tanner. He then was a postdoc at Penn, uh, working with the BJ Kumar in the Grasp Lab. And then he joined um, UC Riverside, where he's currently an assistant professor in the ECE department. Um, today, he will talk about applications of robotics to um, agriculture, which is part of a broad range of topics he has been uh, investigating as his research uh, agenda is very broad and spans both uh, theory and applications. And without further ado, uh, the stage is yours, Costas. Thanks for being here. Great. Uh, thanks, Stefan, and thanks, uh, thanks for the kind invitation. Thanks for everyone being here. So today, we'll talk about the recent work we have been doing on, uh, on agricultural robotics. But before that, I want to give just a brief overview of what we're working on because, as Stefan mentioned, we have started working in, uh, in a few things, but there is a common thread among all of this, and this is uh, you know, our main research focus, which is how can we enable efficient multi-robot operation in the real world, and in certain cases, having robots working alongside humans by harnessing uncertainty. And this is the key here, is that we try to leverage different dynamics, for example, from the environment, different dynamics of the robot environment interactions and human-robot interactions in certain cases to make autonomy better. So the uncertainty in general that can arise is because of the task, and to, I'll discuss this a little bit today, because of the environment, because of the system, and that includes both actuation and perception, and that goes really all the way back to my PhD. And the tools we have been developing is really integrating design and fabrication with dynamical systems theory, modeling, learning, control, as well as higher level autonomy in the sense of task, task and motion planning and autonomy and autonomous decision making. And certain applications we've been focusing on, and all of these are actually funny projects now either from uh, mostly from NSF, but also from, from USDA, and that's one project with, uh, with Stefano, ranges from emergency response, which was something perhaps a little bit more traditional, closer to what I did back as PhD slash postdoc, and then moving on to environmental modeling, precision agriculture, which is the focus of today, and more recently on pediatric rehabilitation. And to give you an, an idea, because you may say, okay, this is too diverse, where is the, the commonality? We started, for example, developing um, soft-legged robots as part of my career award. And we noticed that this type of soft actuators, which are legs, can actually be used within wearable, soft wearable devices. And that was the base, for example, for a recent NRI, which is on soft, uh, soft wearable robotics for pediatric rehabilitation. And I, I, you know, if you let me talk, I will keep making these connections among the different projects we have in the lab, but there is a common underlying theme in all of this uh, diversity here. Today, however, I will focus on, uh, on agricultural robotics and on two main areas. One is on the mobility. So exploration and planning is the first part of this talk. And the second is on how can we co-optimize or integrate actuation perception for a range of toppings that involve sampling, both proximal and physical. So starting with autonomous mobility and reactive exploration more specifically. The context here is that we want to be able to collect data. This is now agnostic to the sensor, so it's a little bit higher level. So we want to be able to collect data with non-holonomic robots. So they cannot move in any way that we would like. And we want to do this without having to go over the same, the same area twice or multiple times. And while we do that, we have absolutely no idea about the map. All the information is what are the boundaries of the map. Uh, let me get the highlighter. Oops, no, sorry. One last pen. Not the point. So the only assumption we make here is that we know what are the boundaries of the map, but we have no idea if there are obstacles or if we talk about quadrotors, there are no flying zones. We discovered this at runtime and we need to maintain some form of, of optimality at runtime. Uh, and for example, if we have an original plan and as we go on, we see that, so looking at this point, that um, that path is now blocked, we want to be able at runtime to be able to come up with a different trajectory and maintain stability. And we're going to merge this with um, certain perception related tasks. For example, we don't want very abrupt motion. And I'll discuss this in a second. 
So we're going to be able to achieve a resolution complete field coverage for non holonomic robots without knowing any information or without knowing anything about the map. And we want in this case to avoid collisions while being able to balance coverage and exploration speed. The way we have done it, and you know, this is a core planning question, and there are lots of other works that are asking similar questions. What was unique in this approach is that actually we used two different coordinate systems. One is the typical grid coordinate system, which is the Cartesian, the gold frame, where we use sensors to be able to describe higher level tasks. And then a lower level cube or hexagonal frame, which is pretty unique in the sense that it allows to traverse. So if the robot is here, it can go to all these six directions with the same unit cost. And this is actually key in order to be able to enable how to go from one hexel to another using only smooth motions and do this in an optimal way. And once you put in the context of coverage planning without actually either leaving gaps as you do this, for example, if you did a lawn mower and there was an obstacle right in the middle which you didn't know, that would include, should include a huge suboptimality. So the lawn would go, then keep going, leave this all empty and, and then have to go back. So our method will actually go and prioritize that, that area in a nutshell. And using this, uh, this kind of hierarchy here actually does make this possible. Um, we have two modes. One is observing mode and the other is transitioning mode. In the observing mode, in this case, we start with a robot. We assume it has certain sensing modality, which is the, the circle you see here so with, um, with the, the light yellow. And we assume that if it makes a full circle, which is based on what is its minimum turning radius, it will be able to create a, a larger circle that's going to be covered. And then once we have this full covered circle, then we can put a hexagon in there. And this is how we actually map the grid cell um, to the robot perception. And this is agnostic what are the sensors. We can always adjust it according to if we have a lighter of shorter or, or longer range, for example. And then we also have, uh, so we have, so these are the navigation sensors. We assume that there is already a camera, for example, that would be collecting information. Again, this is at a higher level. We don't talk about how to actually sample this at this case, but we are talking about how to create means to be able to sample. So the main idea in, the, in terms of planning in this method is how can we go once we have these hex cells, how we can go from one uh, hex cell to another in an optimal way. And the main rationale is that if the robot is, for example, here, and there are unvisited but obstacle-free hex cells next to this position, then we want to select the one that has the greatest number of visited or other occupied neighbors as the next one to, to visit. So in this case, for example, here, gray cells are those that have been visited. The dust one is uh, one that is unvisitable. For example, this may be an obstacle that was determined at runtime. And then the blue ones are those that are to be visited and can be visited. So S1 has three visited cells around it and one unvisitable. Whereas S2 has two visited cells, these two, around it. So in this specific case, the algorithm will, will select the one that has the most uh, visited, the most unvisited, uh, the, the most visited cells. So if you do this, this will actually bias the search to go toward almost explored areas so that you do not leave a, a gap behind. That, for example, Lone Mower would do. And this is one of the ways that actually we can um, we can ensure complete coverage, as I will say in a second. Now, if you end up in a position where there are no adjacent cells that have some visitable hex cell to visit, then we need to backtrack to the last one that had some visited cells, as in, in here. So in this case, we'll find the shortest path to the one that was the next, the nearest one, using a star in this case, that has some unvisited cells, go to this and then uh, repeat the process. So that, these are the two cases. I have some unvisited cell next to me versus I have no unvisited cells next to me, so I need to backtrack. And once we have either the next, when once we have the next cell to visit, whereas this is the, an adjacent or it has a longer connection like in the, in the bottom image, then this is where we actually bring in the, um, the kinematics or kinodynamics in some sense of the robot in the sense of enforcing smooth trajectories. 
Um, if you cover, if you carry, for example, a camera and you want to be able to contain to to get footage, you don't want the robot to do a stop and go navigation. So you move, stop, move, stop, turn, because this is making too too uh, bad footage. And if you need to use that footage to make decision, for example, there is um, um, if if it is in the field, for example, these trees are more uh, more yellow, let's say. Uh, than what they are should be, there should be, then you do want to have the robots to to move in an as as smooth manner as possible, so that the data that are being collected are actually better. So in order to be able to do that, we use pretty, pretty much geometry, um, and we rely to the so-called Dubin curves. These are ways that non-holonomic moves as a combine by using a combination of straight line and minimum curvature, minimum curvature trajectories. And that's exactly what we do here. So if the robot is in the gray cell, then there is the time we find, so we have these circles that are being used to, to create if the robot is doing a full circle inside the hex cell. Between two cells that we want, we are and we want to go, we find the, um, the tangent points. And then if the robot is, let's say, new i in this cell, it will move until the tangent point phi i to get into mid m or mu j or mid j in Greek, that will be how it will connect to the next cell. And we can do exactly the same process even if we have longer term relations between two cells, in which case we will need to have multiple circles and then through geometry find the, the tangent points and then go from one to another. And the beauty of these things, yes. Closest, I'm sorry, I want to ask a question. If it, mm -hmm. in um, this model, I'm just curious about the sensor model because yes. it looks like it's causing the robot to sort of do these full circular maneuvers and then move. And is, is does that, are you account, going to account for for error? Yes. In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the motion, okay. So, the, I mean, I will talk about the full circle. So, I, I, but let me tell you a little bit on that. So. Right now, I do agree with you that if there is error in the motion and that is not being um, resolved, then this would, resol would lead into approximations and eventually you will lose some of the covered area. But here, at least at the higher level, we assume that we can actually do follow these trajectories using some type of trajectory tracking controller, which in most cases, and I do have some examples from physical robots as well, that this works pretty well, even actually without significant feedback. Um, so I would say yes, I mean, that is a valid comment, but I think we will be able to resolve it unless we walk into very, very dynamic environments, in which case there will be other issues that would be, I would say, more important to resolve. So if you were, if you were having uh, UAVs flying in a very, very windy day, then yes, and soon you fall on this circle is hard. This is one. And the second one, which I will talk soon, is that we can actually remove the full circles. And this is a way that we can actually trade off between coverage and speed of search. And I'll show you this in a moment. Right now, the, the circles is the necessary evil in order to be able to, do, to actually guarantee full coverage. Resolution complete, but full coverage in that sense. Does, does this answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and then if we go, if we use this one, we will be able to go from one cell to another. And uh, the beauty of, of this is that because these are all geometric expressions, these are analytical expressions, we can do a forward evaluation, meaning that we can compute all of these at runtime with very, very limited uh, computational resources. And that's something that in general we try to implement, I mean, across the research that we do in my group, like we try to do online implementation of all of this, uh, all of all the planning alpha that we're developing. So, right now, one negative is that in order to guarantee cover resolution complete coverage, you will have to do the full circle because this is dependent on the radius of the, of the, or the sensing radius of the robot. So, if you do not have a 360 radius, for example, that can somehow cover the whole cell, but you have a limited field of view, let's say camera, you will need to circle, move in a circle, cover the whole area and then move on. But we can get a result, we can actually prove, and in, in the paper we have actually proved the resolution completeness. Now, if for any reason we don't want that, the method also allows us to trade off between speed, expression speed and the, and the coverage. And what we do is that instead of doing the full circle, 
we can just skip the circle, find the tangent points and then go from where we are to the tangent points to the next one and then keep going, which is what you see here. And this is the HDCP. So HDCP stands for Hex Decomposed Coverage Planner, which is our method. E is for the one that we have optimized for exploration speed. And we have evaluated this both in simulation and in hardware experiments. In simulation, we did a pretty extensive one in 3D type of environments, which resemble environments that you can see in um, emergency response, environmental monitoring, and, and precision ag, for example, in the in row environment. And we tested five different algorithms our own, the, the variant that we tuned for, for speed, an older version from our work, which is specifically tuned for multi robot systems, and then spanning three certs and bootstrapped on A start. A start. Um, and we had two two positions to like you know similar to an ablation study to see how the, the algorithm would work one on the center one on the left corner and in each case we had 10 trials so just an example to see how the method performs this is a random environment where the robot departs at the center this is our method and you can see that it has smooth movements in certain cases it has the full circle as, as in here but it has smooth movement and it covers the more area, so white, the more white, the better. And if we tune it for, for, for speed, then we do actually leave certain areas less covered. So this part, for example, um, we can still have some circles, but it's not the same amount of circling as you see in here. And I'll show you some numerical results, but it has outperformed all other, which at the stay at the time were the state of the art and i think our method is still the state of the art um, so both cases we can plan smooth paths for the robot and also these are being moved uh, these are being followed at constant speed whereas uh, the other two competing methods the stc and ba star they will have actual paths that contain sharp turns and this will include suboptimality if you now want to merge or co-optimize let's say planning slash mobility with perception and um, scene understanding. See, there is a question. Okay. Um, all right, Stavros. Uh, so moving on, this is a physical implementation of the robot on the robot using uh, virtual objects or virtual obstacles. And we're trying now to put it actually out in the field. Um, but even in the hardware, we did 10, experiment, 10 experiments and we saw that if we tune the, the, the approach for coverage, then we cover the, the more area. If we tune our approach for exploration speed, then we are the fastest in terms of amount of area covered by, per unit uh, time. And these are the trajectories, some sample, one sample trajectory from the 10 trials with our physical robot. And that here was the virtual, um, virtual obstacle. So before I move on, are there any questions I can I can answer here? Well, that was about like higher level exploration. I'll go a little bit now into merging with task, task and motion planning. So if there are any questions, I can move on. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so you, you showed kind of two algorithms. One was optimized for speed and one was optimized more for coverage of the area. Um, so I was just curious what are kind of situations when you would decide to use one versus the other? That's a good question. So the very general slash generic answer would be that it depends on your application, right? Um, so what I could say is that if you want to quickly get an idea of what's going on in an area, then you will probably need to go for, for the exploration speed. But then if you have an idea and then you want to focus on making sure, so for example, if you have a task where you're looking for survivors, there you need to go slowly make sure that you do not accidentally miss something so this would be roughly speaking a distinction but really i mean i will need to give you the generic answer that it does really depend on the application you are interested in but again our approach here the rationale was that exactly because there is no single unified application we want to be able to provide methodologies that can be tuned according to needs of of, of a practitioner user and so on thanks all right, so moving on, 
Now I want to go a little bit on to how can we start, again, still on the planning, but how can we now start merging into the task, in the, merging the task into the picture. So typically, or at least in our cases, we we give a task urgency level. So for example, if you need to, to sample from an area, you need to go and sample that area first compared to other areas. And how you can do this is, for example, if you have a buy, buy some previous information, for example, previous soil moisture information, and you know that there is an area that the sprinkles are typically broken, you know, that would give a higher task urgency to the sen in the sense of send the robot to sample there. However, because we talk now about very dynamic environments in the environment, like in, in, in the field, it rains whatever prior soil, soil moisture maps we had from the day before are now garbage. So we do need to factor in the prior information, but take it with a pinch of salt. So how can we do this while uh, we have certain urgency in the tasks is what we're trying to answer here. And also we do not assume that the robot can do everything magically, but there are certain specific budgets on what it can do. For example, if you want the robot to water, there's a fine amount of water it can carry before it has got to go back and, and replenish the water. If it is picking fruit, there is a specific amount of weight it can carry. And if you put one more apple, let's say, for example, then the whole thing may, may start to tem 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 down or even stuck in place. Um, and in all of this, what we think it's going to cost, for example, to cut a fruit may be pretty different in practice. So these are the four things that we try to now to balance in our approach. And that we try to do it through optimal sampling. And that means which tasks, like where to sample or where to go in the field to sample. So select that and schedule it, given some prior information. And at the same time, find an optimal stopping time so that the robot should decide, okay, enough is enough. It's better for me to, to go back and replenish or drop whatever I'm being cutting and then continue instead of being a little bit greedy saying, oh, maybe I can do something more. And then that can lead, for example, to robot being having more, more weight than can cut and then actually stuck in play, getting stuck in place. We have been using the notion of the ale graph and to actually get into the, uh, these uh, four considerations extending to the stochastic version, so the stochastic L graph. What we do here is that we take, for example, four trees here, which are the four nodes that you see. Um, we do consider, and in, let me rephrase, we do enforce that the robot will have to go and move in rows. So, and then we do assume that if, if it gets into one row, it will have to go out from the other end of that same row. Um, and once we have this, the way we do it is that then we, we add two virtual columns, which are those that are dust here. So these do not really exist, but we use them for, um, for computational necessity in order to make actually things, uh, things work here. They play no computational role though. And we assume that the base stations are actually in those um, virtual, um, virtual nodes, which physically now would be outside of the field. Here I'm showing only this part, but you could think of if I want to extend how it would extend, it just doesn't fit in this slide. We do have two budgets and one assumption we've been making in this case, which in certain cases it is true, in certain other cases is not necessarily true, is that the budget, the two the budgets are independent. So we have an energy budget for the robot to move, and this is typically how long the battery will suffice. And we have a resource budget that is linked to task execution. Now, this is not true about independent when, for example, you want to perform tasks that do affect the energy of the robot. So, for example, that's something that has to do with weight. I add more low payload or I removing payload. But most importantly, I, I add more payload, like picking fruit. Um, so these two are, are not independent in that case, but at least at this stage, we have done this, um, this analysis with assuming that the two bodies are independent. And we also consider that once the robot go into the base station, they can reset the initial values of both budgets. So they replenish the battery and then either they replenish their payload if, or, or they empty their payload, depends on what the task is. 
So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but instead I'll just do a, a, a sketch of how this method works. So the, the next best action planning algorithm we have developed can balance sampling feasible vertices on these stochastic L graphs and determine when it is better to actually exit, so return back to base station, instead of doing one more sample or attempting to sample one more, one more time. And we do use actually three phases. So in the first phase, we sample feasible, uh, feasible vertices that are subject to resource budget. So do I have enough water, for example, to water some one more plant? Do I have enough payload to pick one more food? So this is the first determination that is being happening. And we start with these are the highest priority level. Now, the priority level, I give a very toy, a very simple toy example here. For example, in this node, we put the two. This is a priority level. And that, for example, we can create it through any prior map that we may have. So, for example, if I know that there is a specific tree that may be fruiting more than others, so I can actually carry more fruit, I can pick more fruit from a single tree, I would give it a high priority. It's not entirely sure that this is indeed the case. That's why we have to decide this optimal stopping policy eventually. But at least it gives us some bias in order to be able to initiate the process. Uh, the second phase is that from all those visible vertices that we pick from phase one, pick those that there is enough energy budget to go for. So if, for example, there is a very, very high rewarding uh, vertex over here, let's say, but it has a lot of cost to go there and may not be enough for the robot to go, it will actually prefer sample a lower value vertex, but at least it will be able to do the task. Because we do consider that if the robot go, um, goes to, to sample a vertex and it runs out of a budget, you lose pretty much everything. So you put one more fruit and everything is falling down. You can think of this example. Um, again, these tools are actually pretty typical within finance. I mean, optimal stopping is, is used in a lot in, in finance. So this, there are similar analogies there. And in the, in the last uh, phase, after we have an idea about feasible vertices from phase one filtered through phase two, if there are still vertices, then we go into that row and we go into what are the plants and we keep repeating this process. Again, this is a very high overview and I can talk offline in more detail about this, but in the interest of time, I hope at least it gives some idea about how we prioritize the search in this, uh, in this graph. Um, and I'll show you how it works. So we have tested the algorithm in simulation, but using real world data of, of solids moisture. So this is uh, thanks to, uh, to Stefano for collecting this data. Um, he was uh, kind enough to share it with us. So we had a full, um, a full data set from 10, so 10 different set data sets, and these are across different times. So they are actually pretty diverse. One example is what you see here, and this is soil moisture. So in our case, we tested both single and five robot uh, case studies, and we compared our method against the naive lawnmower. So I just do the typical lawnmower pattern. Informed lawnmower, which is I use the bias into determining which row the lawnmower should start at. And then the series greedy parcel row planner. And the um, comparison was made in terms of percentage of gain per visited vertex. Wasted resources if you abort tasks. Again, if you abort a task, you lose all resources. So we want to minimize this. And we want to increase the per to maximize the percentage of gain. And total visited vertices. And we saw that uniformly with this approach, we can actually do better in all three uh, metrics. And in, in fact, actually, in, in 13 out of the 20 cases we had, we, the, if you were to follow this approach, you would waste no resources. And this is because we can factor in the uncertainty that there is in task execution and in prior bias from the map, you know, to make a more informed decision about should I sample or should I not be greedy and go back and replenish and then move on. So, any questions here? I know, I mean, I, I went a little bit fast over that. I do. I did want to have a little bit of time for the for the more hardware-related aspects 
not only spend all of my time of planning, but perhaps I can make a quick stop here for for any questions. I think, uh, Costas, keep going because we, we want to see where you're going. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. No more planning, um, but we are going to get into the, um, the sampling and how to perform sampling. And I have three different case studies that um, we've been working. One is on proximal sensing and the other two are on physical sampling. So the proximal sensing example that we have considered is how can we measure apparent soil electrical, um, electrical conductivity. And this is really important because this is really one of the best ways that you can get salinity levels of soil. It depends on the soil, so there, there is the soil science that goes behind it, but in a nutshell, through electrical conductivity, we can map this to salinity and we can map this into the irrigation pattern. Is the irrigation pattern okay? Uh, are there enough nutrition in some sense into the soil? Again, I'm not working on this. I'm able to provide the data so that uh, environmental scientists can make these decisions and make this, um, this analysis in a more informed way. There are three, well, three. There are two ways that you, this is happening today. Either you have a person walking an electromagnetic inference stick down the field, which is tedious and pretty labor intensive, or the good thing here is that you can actually get the sensor however very close to the to the tree root, which is what is really needed, or you can have a higher uh, kind of dimensionality solution where an ATV is carrying a sensor. So this is more scalable, but the sensor now is larger and is further away from the tree root, which is something we don't want. So in this work, we were trying to see if we can automate this process using much, much smaller autonomous robots. And just as a, as a comparison, this is our, our robot. This is the Rosbot 2.0 for reference. And really here we have put much, much more payload than what is currently rated and it worked pretty well in the field. So I'm, I'm really happy. I would, I would recommend this robot actually. Um, now, the problem is that because both of these current practices are for one way or another not super scalable, a very low limit, only 20% of US growers are actually using these, um, these measurements to trigger irrigation. But this is really what they should be doing. If you talk with some soil scientists, they will tell you, you know, you have to do that. But it's not happening in practice. And this, so this work tries to, um, to improve certain challenges so that perhaps it can be adopted more by, by growers. So we made a portable robotic solution, or let me, so let me say not made. We have done our first step into a portable robotic solution for automating this whole process. And we did in this study the sensor integration so that, for example, we can get a reasonable data without having too much interference from the robot, which is metal on the electromagnetic sensor. And we also did field testing compared to the handheld solution. Now, the electromagnetic sensor, the way it works is that it emits a field on one end. This is going through the soil and it is being, so a second induced secondary field through the soil is being generated. And then the difference, let's say, between the two is being read by the other end of the sensor. And once we have this electrical conductivity, then again, our, our soil scientist collaborators are taking this information and are mapping this eventually to soil salinity. I'm not going to say anything more because I don't know much about this, so I don't want to say anything wrong. Again, our work here is how can we enable this data collection to be more scalable, both across spatial domain and temporal domain. So we did the, the, the original design, which was how can we place the sensor here so that there is minimum interference from the robot while the robot can actually traverse. Um, some reasonable terrain. Ideally, you want to take this robot, you want to increase the age as much as possible. But if, for example, we're putting the sensor over here, the robot would have absolutely no way to get into a very small, over a very small pebble. Um, so there is some optimization here. And in this graph, we saw that at different measurements, so we put the stick at different distances from the robot, and we see, we measure what is the interference, and we try to balance mechanical and mobility constraints with sensing constraints. And our results show that we can get consistent data. So here, these are handheld 
data. And these are data that we did by moving in a straight line in a field using our solution. Um, we get consistent data, but they are amplified because of the interference. So it turns out there is a constant DC gain. We've, we, we've figured this out here and we remove it from, uh, from the readings that the, the robot decides data contain. And that works pretty well in a much bigger context. So we created DCA maps, uh, the electrical soil conductivity maps into an olive growth. And we tested against, so we tested the robot, the automated solution against the handheld. Um, we had a 50 by 30 meter olive growth with relatively sandy uh, soil. Um, we haven't tested other soils. That's part of what we need to do in the future. Um, but at least we got some, some interesting data, which I'll discuss. And then the, the special maps have a resolution of 0.5 meters. So at top, you see the, the, the ECA map that is created by actually walking the stick in the field. And in the bottom, you see the, the data that's been created by having the robot driving in this low mole pattern in this case. We haven't integrated the planning into this part yet. And so what you see is that although there are the coloring is a little bit different, values are, are related and higher areas of con high concentration areas are actually being mapped by both, uh, both methods. So there is still room for improvement here. And these are like numerical results in terms of mean and sun deviations. Um, so these are promising results are by no means great, but they are promising. And we try to, to improve and, and um, to improve on this pretty much by using a little bit larger robots, work on the insulation so that we can uh, remove the interference as much as possible. Again, more on the co-optimization of, of this type of sensing and, and hardware and actuation, which is this, the, the, whole month, the common thing in the remainder of the stock. The second approach that I want to discuss today is about physical sampling, and this is sampling insects. Um, so the whole idea here is that it is challenging to sample frequently insects in the environment that they can propagate certain disease. There is a lot of manual labor, even if you want to just put sticky traps on the tree on the trees, putting them there, going pick them, picking them up is more more labor intensive than it might than it might be looking. Um, and if you do this, the, the time between sampling the insect to taking it to the lab and making any analysis, for example, eventually phenotyping, is something that may be um, too large to be giving us anything useful. So here we are trying to develop autonomous robots that can enable rapid on demand and as with the previous case, spatial temporally dense insect sampling. And that's our first attempt. So we have designed a trap which can get airborne on a commercial UAV. This is the Matrice uh, 100. Um, we try to lose weight a little bit here, but at least this one is, is a working prototype. And what is interesting here is that we did actually lots of experiments with house flies because there are different means that to lure the insect inside the, the trap. We have tested only with light-based lures so far. Odor-based would be something else to test in the future, but so far we've done light-based using uh, UV LED. And we tested different cores. What you see here is the, the tri-panel core I have here. So there are three panels, one, two, and one more in the back. This is one parameter. Uh, we had also some LED strips, which were pretty interesting. And we tested it, and out of this, it happened that it, the data showed us that um, the 395 nanometer single panel works better. Again, there is more testing, but at least at this stage, we got an idea. These things did not exist before this study. So right now, we have an idea of how to lure house flies into this type of small structures that are only light based, no other lure. And within the trap itself, we also tested, we also integrate temperature and humidity sensors and the night vision camera, you can see the, the fly here. The rationale is that we want to be able to count how many flies we have auto automatically um, in, in the near future. We do not have that, 
that capability yet. Another interesting part, at least in, in my eyes, was on the actual hardware design. Like we wanted to be able to design the trap so that the flies will walk in there, but they are not going to be able to get inside. So they will go because they are attracted to the lure, but they, for any reason they, they need to leave, they cannot any longer. So we did a static test of seeing how, like what is, if we use this conical shape uh, entry points, what is the minimum dimension of, of the cone so the, the, the flies can get trapped and not get out. And we did six trials with 25 trials with 25 um, house flies in each trial and we tested five different sun dimensions three four five and six three four five six and seven millimeters the average fly the average body width of the flies we used was five millimeters so it turns out that falling millimeter minimum radius is doing the trick can trap 90 percent of the flies and out of those that are being trapped 96 or about 97 percent remain so this gives us a total of 87 percent capture rate um, and what is also pretty interesting is that we took whatever you see here and we tested it with mosquitoes just really out of curiosity initially to see how it works and it turns out that it works pretty well although the the, the trap was not mechanically or hardware designed for mosquitoes that are very different from house flies, the trap was able to retain them and keep them in there. So this is something pretty interesting. And to give you an, an idea, the state of the art in this case now, if you want to use something more automated, is the Microsoft Premonition Projects um, trap, which is a massive trap. It can measure and can quantify what is the fly that gets, what is the insect gets in by, by looking into the, the wing bit. But it is massive and you cannot have many of them. Our approach instead is that you take lots of these, you deploy them in the field and you can even do it in an on-demand on fashion. Um, so in that case, we go for sampling more and sampling more densely and using that information. And in terms of uh, some, initial te some additional testing we did, we test to see if we have flies in here, let's say captured, and then we have the UAV flying, will they survive the flight? Will they go out? And so we did uh, 50 flies inside the trap. The UAV started moving for five minutes at five and, two, and two meters per second. So lower speed and medium speed. And we're able to retain, to keep 95% of the flies alive. And we also did the mock-up experiment where we use lures to, to, to emulate environmental uh, stimuli. We released hand flies into this um, this greenhouse and for two hours we had this on. We did the two trials and we captured in one I think five and the other seven flies. So the percent capture here is not good but the issue really was that we could not turn off the lights of the adjacent greenhouses and that was really really bad um, because you could see all of the house flies actually getting to the top of of the of the of the of the tarp that there was actually light from from the adjacent greenhouse however we saw that at least that we it is possible to do it in an overall mock-up and that's something that uh, we are actively now working on extending for for insects in agriculture and finally okay i have six minutes so I will go through this quickly and leave about four minutes for questions. So finally, we're also working on leaf retrieval. This is another physical sampling example. Uh, this is our most recent one. We just submitted actually to IROS a couple of days ago. So the core challenge or the main motivation is here is how can we automate leaf water potential measurement? This is really is the standard of practice to determine when to irrigate. And it's extremely, extremely important. And it's as with um, with the AMI sensing, super manually, uh, like manual labor intensive. And because of that, it leads to very sparse sampling. To give you an idea, because it is hard to sample and it is labor intensive to sample, typically growers use only one sentinel tree, either per acre or per field. That I cannot remember that very well. Uh, but it is super, super sparse sampling. And this is extremely important metric, like because this tells us 
almost everything we need to know about leaf, uh, about the, um, the tree health and more importantly, when to start irrigating. We get into the, the new season now, so after blooming, growers have to determine, okay, when should I start watering? Leaf water potential measurement is the way to make this decision. And again, in contrast to walking a stick in the field, collecting the data and then putting them on, let's say, to the cloud, there is a temporal component here which is important. So by the time you cut the leaf, there is only a very limited amount of time before you put into the pressure chamber and you do this analysis, which is the, to identify the potential. If you wait, the, the reading is no longer valid. And to do it in situ, you need a person that has expertise in doing that. So not any, any farm worker. So you need specialized in that case personnel, which are very, very limited. So again, that's another really good um, um, problem, let's say, or there is a really need motivation for some automation. So here we're trying to develop autonomous robots to enable again, rapid on demand and special temporarily dense leaf water potential measurement and analysis. And the very first thing, the very first step, which I'm talking today is how can we cut a leaf from a, from a tree cleanly at its stem. And I don't to have much, it's just the, the final video that we submitted to, to IROS. Um, so I'll let it play and then the steps here pretty much that we're doing is visual perception in terms of identifying leaves, getting their six deposition, and then from there aligning the custom end effector we designed with the leaf getting in this case into the leaf and then this, cutting it. And here you can see, for example, the leaf that is being cut. And we did this multiple times. It works well for um, to, to a certain extent in the sense that when leaves are relatively on their own and not clustered, then we can get into the leaf and cut it repeatedly, cut it in the stem cleanly as we need. But when the leaves start um, merging together, and then we may end up pushing the whole uh, or other leaves out of the way and then pushing the leaf also a little bit outside and then the cut may not be ideal. So this is something that we are working on right now on improving. But at least again, this is the first time that uh, it is possible to cut leaves fully autonomously using a way that you can also retain them. And it's not pulling a leaf for example, that some prior work has focused on. And it's closed loop in the sense of getting data from the stereo camera, which is here, to see where is the leaf in, in, uh, in 3D space, localize it. Well, identify that the leaf, localize it, and then do the uh, approach of visual surveying. Visual surveying is what we focus on right now. So with that, um, Again, talked about mobility, motion planning, and then how, so which is where to sample, and then also how to sample. Many thanks to lots of folks that have been um, been participating in these projects. No, so these are five papers that I talked to you about in, in less than an hour. And now it's a lot of material, uh, but I'm pretty excited about this work, and uh, I hope I got you excited a bit. So many thanks to all, to, to collaborators and folks um, in, in my group. And thank you all for, for attending this presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kosos.